um, and we shall continue with The Count of Monte Cristo. Once I remember what chapter number we're on. <laughs> One second. <laughs> oh, God. Hang on. So that's... My brain hurts. So this must be 92, I guess. Yes. Anyway. Roman numerals. Why? Every time. Chapter 92. Suicide. Meanwhile, Monte Cristo had also gone back into town with Emmanuel and Maximilien. Their return was merry. Emmanuel did not disguise his joy at seeing war replaced by peace and loudly proclaimed his philanthropic feelings. Marel, seated in a corner of the carriage, let his brother-in-law's merriment evaporate in words and kept his own joy to himself, allowing it to shine only in his look, though it was no less sincere. At the Barrière du Trône they met Bertuccio, who was waiting there as motionless as a sentry on duty. Monte Cristo put his head out and exchanged a few words with him, then the steward disappeared. Count, said Emmanuel when they got to the Place Royale, please drop me off at my front door so that my wife will not have a single unnecessary moment of anxiety for either of us. If it was not ridiculous to go around proclaiming one's triumph, said Morel, I should invite the Count into our, our home, but he too has no doubt some anxious minds to put at rest. Here we are, Emmanuel. Let's say goodbye to our friend and allow him to go on his way. One moment, said Monte Cristo. Don't deprive me in this way of both my companions together. Go in and see your wife and give her my respects. And you, Morel, come with me to the Champs Elysees. Perfect, said Maximilien. Particularly since I have something to attend to in your part of town, Count. Can we expect you for lunch? asked Emmanuel. No, Morel replied. The door closed and the carriage went on its way. You see, I brought you good luck, said Morel when he was alone with the Count. Did that occur to you? Certainly, said Monte Cristo. That's why I always want to keep you by me. It's a miracle, said Morel in answer to his, to his own thoughts. What is? asked Monte Cristo. Well, what has happened? <laughs> yes, the Count said, smiling. That's the right word, Morel. A miracle. Because Albert is brave enough. Very much so, said Monte Cristo. I've seen him sleeping with a dagger hanging over his head. And I know that he has fought twice already, and very well, Morel said. So how does that square with his behaviour this morning? Your influence again, said Monte Cristo, still smiling. Lucky for Albert, he's not a soldier, said Morel. Why? Excuses on the field, the young captain said, shaking his head. Now, now, the Count said gently, don't let's give, away, give way to these prejudices of ordinary people, Morel. You must agree that, since Albert is brave, he cannot be a coward, so he must have had some reason to act as he did this morning, and that consequently his behaviour was more heroic than otherwise. No doubt, said Morel, but like the Spaniard, I would say he was not as brave today as he was yesterday. You'll take lunch with me, won't you, Morel? the Count said, to change the subject. No, I'm afraid I must leave you at ten o'clock. So your appointment is for lunch? Morel smiled and shook his head. But you must eat somewhere. But suppose I am not hungry? Ah, said the Count, I know of only two things which can spoil one's appetite like that. Pain, and since I'm pleased to say you seem very happy, it can't be that, and love. Moreover, in view of what you told me about your affections, I may perhaps surmise... I won't deny it, Count, Morel said merrily. But you're not telling me about it, Maximilien, the Count said, in a tone of voice that showed how curious he was to learn the secret. 
Didn't you? Sh didn't I show you this morning that I have a heart? In reply, Monte Cristo offered the young man his hand. Well, he continued, as that heart is no longer with you in the Bois de Vincent, it is somewhere else, and I am going to recover it. Go on, then, the Count said slowly. Go, my dear friend, but do this for me. If you should encounter any obstacle, remember that I have some power in this world, that I am happy to use it for the benefit of those I love, and that I love you, Morel. Thank you, the young man said. I shall remember it as selfish children remember their parents when they need them. When I need you, Count, and that time may come, I shall ask for your help. Very well, I have your word. Goodbye now. Au revoir. They had reached the door of the house on the Champs-Élysées. Monte Cristo opened the door, and Morel jumped on to the pavement. Bertuccio was waiting at the steps. Morel vanished down the Avenue de Marigny, and Monte Cristo walked quickly over to Bertuccio. Well? he asked. Well, she is leaving her house, said the steward. And her son? Florentin, his valet, thinks he will do the same. Come with me. Monte Cristo took Bertuccio into his study, wrote the letter that we have already seen, and gave it to the steward. Go, and go quickly, he said, adding, Oh, and have Heidi told that I am back. I am here, said the girl, who had already come down at the sound of the carriage, her face shining with joy at seeing the Count safe and sound. Bertuccio went out. In the first moments after this return, which she had awaited with such impatience, Hedi experienced all the emotion of a daughter reunited with a dear father, and all the delirium of a mistress greeting an adored lover. And Monte Cristo's joy, though less expansive, was no less great. For hearts which have long suffered, happiness, happiness is like dew on soil parched by the sun. Both heart and earth absorb this beneficial rain as it falls on them, and nothing appears on the surface. For some days, Monte Cristo had realised something that, for a long time, he had not dared to believe, which is that there were two Mercedes in the world, and he could once more be happy. His eyes, burning with gladness, were eagerly fixed on those of Hedi, when suddenly the door opened. The Count frowned. Monsieur de Morcerf, said Baptistin, as if the name itself were enough to excuse the interruption. And the Count's face did indeed lighten. Which one? he asked. Viscount or Count? The Count. My God! Hedi exclaimed. Is it not over yet? I do not know if it is finished, my dearest child, Monte Cristo said, taking the young woman's hands. What I do know is that you have nothing to fear. But this is the wretch. The man is powerless against me, Hedi, Monte Cristo said. The time to fear was when I had to deal with his son. You will never know, master, how I suffered, she said. He smiled and put a hand on her head. I swear on my father's grave, he said, that if anyone is to suffer, it will not be me. I believe you, my lord, as if God were speaking to me, she said, offering him her forehead. Monte Cristo gave her pure and beautiful brow a kiss that made two hearts beat together, one urgently, the other in silence. Oh, God, the Count murmured, will you then let me love again? He took the young Greek woman towards a concealed staircase and said to Baptistin, Show the Comte de Morcerf into the drawing-room. A word of explanation may be needed. This visit, though Monte Cristo had expected it, will no doubt come as a surprise to our readers. While Mercedes, as we mentioned, was in her apartments making the same sort of inventory as Albert had done in his house, sorting through her jewels, closing her drawers and collecting her keys so as to leave everything in perfect order, 
She did not notice a sinister, bloodless face appear in the glass window of a door designed to let light enter the corridor. From that point, one could hear as well as, as well as see. So it seems more than likely that the person who was watching there, without himself being seen or heard, saw and heard all that went on in Madame de Morcerf's. From the glass door, the pale-faced man went into the Comte de Morcerf's bedroom, and, once there, restively lifted the curtain on a window overlooking the courtyard. He stayed there for ten minutes, motionless, silent, listening to the beating of his own heart. It was a long time for him, ten minutes. It was at this point that Albert, returning from his appointment, saw his father watching for him to return behind the curtain, and turned his head. The Count's eyes opened wide. He knew that Albert's insult to Monte Cristo had been fearful, and that, in every country in the world, such an insult would be followed by a duel to the death. So, if Albert was returning safe and sound, then he was avenged. An unspeakable ray of joy lit his dreary face, like a last ray of sunshine from the sun disappearing into clouds which seem less like its bed than the tomb. Less like its bed than its tomb. But, as we said, he waited in vain for the young man to come up to his apartments to proclaim his triumph to his father. It was understandable that his son, before going out to fight, had not wanted to see the father whose honour he was to avenge, but once that had been done, why did the son not come and throw himself into his arms? At this point, since he could not see Albert, the Count sent for his servant. As we know, Albert told the servant to hide nothing from him. Ten minutes later, General de Morcerf appeared on the front steps wearing a black coat with a military collar, black trousers and black gloves. It appears that he had already given orders because he had hardly put his foot on the last step when his carriage appeared, fully harnessed, out of the coach house and drew up in front of him. His valet then arrived with a military cloak, stiffened by the two swords wrapped inside it, which he threw into the carriage. Then he closed the door and sat down beside the coachman. The latter bent over the side of the barouche to take his orders. To the Champs-Élysées, the general said, to the Count of Monte Cristo's. Hurry! The horses leapt forward under the whip, and five minutes later pulled up in front of the Count's house. Monsieur de Morcerf opened the door himself, and, while the carriage was still moving, jumped down like a young man onto the path, rang, then vanished with his servant through the open door. A second later, Baptistin was announcing him to Monte Cristo, and the latter, after showing Hedy out, gave the order to let Monsieur de Morcerf into the drawing room. The general had paced three times the full length of the room when he turned around and saw Monte Cristo standing on the threshold. Oh, it's Monsieur de Morcerf, Monte Cristo said calmly. I thought I had misheard. misheard. Yes, it is I the Count said, with a frightful contraction of the mouth that pre prevented him from pronouncing the words clearly. "'Now all I need to know,' Monte Cristo said, "'is what brings me the pleasure of seeing the Comte de Morcerf at such an early hour. "'Did you have a meeting with my son this morning, sir?' the General asked. "'So you know about that?' the Count replied. I also know that my son had good reason for wishing to fight you and doing his best to kill you. Indeed, monsieur, he had a very good reason. But you see that, even so, he did not kill me, or even fight me. Yet he considered you to be the cause of his father's dishonour, and of the frightful catastrophe that is at the moment afflicting my house. That is so, monsieur, said Monte Cristo with dreadful imperturbability. A secondary course, perhaps. Cause, perhaps, and not the main one. So you must have made some excuse to him, or given some explanation. I gave him no explanation, and he was the one to make his excuses. How do you explain that behaviour? 
probably by his conviction that there was a more guilty man in all this than I. Who was that man? His father. Yes, said the Count, blanching, but you know that the guilty man does not like to hear himself convicted of his crime. I do, so I was, I was expecting what has happened. You were expecting my son to prove himself a coward? The Count exclaimed. Monsieur Albert de Morcerf is not a coward, said Monte Cristo. A man who has a sword in his hand, and within reach of that sword, his mortal enemy. If such a man does not fight, he is a coward. If only he were here for me to tell him so. Monsieur, the Count of Monte Cristo replied coldly, I assume that you did not come to see me to inform me of these trifling family matters. Go and tell Monsieur Albert. He will know how to answer you. Oh, no, the general said, with a smile that vanished as soon as it had appeared. No, you are right. I did not come here for that. I came to tell you that I too regard you as my enemy. I came to tell you that I hate you instinctively and that, that it seems to me that I have always known you, and always hated you. And finally, since the young people of today do not fight, then we shall have to. Do you agree, monsieur? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So when I said that I was expecting what has happened, I was referring to the honour of your visit. So much the better, then. Your preparations are made? They always are, monsieur. You know that we shall fight until one of us is dead? The general said, his teeth clenched with rage. Until one of us is dead, the Count of Monte Cristo repeated, gently nodding his head. Come on then, we need no witnesses. Indeed no, said Monte Cristo. We know one another so well. On the contrary, said the Count, we don't know one another at all. Come now. Monte Cristo replied, with the same infuriating lack of emotion. Aren't you the soldier, Fernand, who deserted on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo? Aren't you the Lieutenant Fernand, who served as a guide and spy for the French army in Spain? Aren't you the Colonel Fernand, who betrayed, sold and murdered his benefactor, Ali? And all these Fernands, did they not finally amount to Lieutenant General Comte de Morcerf? peer of France. Ah! the general cried, the words striking him like a hot iron. You wretch! Do you reproach me with my shame at the moment when you may be about to kill me? No, I did not say that I was unknown to you. I know very well, demon, that you have penetrated the darkness of the past and read every page of my life, though I cannot tell by the light of what torch. But perhaps there is still more honour in me, in my disgrace, than in you, for all your arrogant exterior. No, no, I admit that I am known to you, but I do not know you, you adventurer, smothered in gold and precious stones. In Paris you call yourself the Count of Monte Cristo, in Italy Sinbad the Sailor, in Malta who knows what, I have forgotten. What I ask from you is your real name. I want to know your true name in the midst of these hundred false names, so that I can say it on the field of combat as I plunge my sword in your heart. The Count of Monte Cristo went terribly pale. His wild eyes burned with angry fire. He rushed out into the study adjoining his bedroom, and in less than a second, tearing off his cravat, his coat and his waistcoat, he put on a small sailor's jacket and a sailor's hat, only partly covering his long black hair. Dressed in this way, he returned, fearful, implacable, walking in front of the general with his arms crossed. The other had understood nothing of his disappearance, but was waiting for him, and, feeling his teeth chatter and his legs give way under him, took a step back and stopped only when he reached a table which provided some support for his clenched hands. Fernand, Monte Cristo cried, of my hundred names I shall need to tell you only one to strike you down. But you can already guess that name, can't you? 
or rather you can recall it. For in spite of all my woes, in spite of my tortures, I can now show you a face rejuvenated by the joy of revenge, a face that you must have seen often in your dreams since your marriage, your marriage to my fiancé, Mercedes. The general, his head thrown back, his hands held out, his eyes staring, watched this dreadful spectacle in silence. Then, reaching out for the wall and leaning on it, he slid slowly along it to the door, out of which he retreated backwards, giving this one single lugubrious, lugubrious lamentable, heart-rending cry. Edmund Dantes! Then, with sighs in which there was nothing human, he dragged himself to the front porch of the house, crossed the courtyard like a drunken man, and fell into the arms of his valet, simply muttering in an unintelligible voice, Home! Home! On the way, the fresh air and the shame he felt at the stairs of his servants restored him to a state in which he could gather his thoughts. But the journey was short, and the nearer he got to his home, the more the Count felt all his agony returning. At a short distance from the house, he told them to stop the carriage and let him out. The door to the house was wide open. A cab, astonished at being called to this magnificent mansion, was standing in the middle of the courtyard. The Count looked anxiously at this cab, but did not dare ask anyone about it and ran up to his apartments. Two people were coming down the stairs. He had just t he just had time to slip into a small room to avoid them. It was Mercedes, leaning on her son's arm. Both were leaving the house. They passed a few inches away from the unfortunate man, who, hiding behind a damask curtain, was practically brushed by the hem of Merced excuse me, was practically brushed by the hem of Mercedes' silk dress, and felt on his face the warm breath of these words which his son spoke. Have strength, mother. Come, come, we are no longer at home here. The words died. The footsteps faded. The general drew himself up by his hands, clasping the damask curtain. He was repressing the most frightful sob that ever rose from the breast of a father, abandoned at one and the same time by his wife and by his son. Soon he heard the iron door of the cab slam shut, then the voice of the driver, then the clattering of the heavy vehicle which rattled the windows. At that he flung himself into his bedroom to see once more everything that he had loved in this world. But the cab left without Mercedes's head or Albert's appearing at the window to give one last glance at the solitary house, at the abandoned father and husband, one last glance of farewell and regret, that is to say, of forgiveness. So, at the very moment when the wheels of the cab were clattering over the cobbles under the archway, a shot rang out and a whiff of dark smoke curled out through one of those bedroom windows, shattered by the force of the detonation. Chapter 93 Valentine The reader will have guessed where Morel's business was and whom he was due to meet. On leaving Monte Cristo, he made his way slowly towards the Vifor house. If he went slowly, it is because he had more than half an hour to cover a distance of five hundred yards, but he had still hastened to take his leave of Monte Cristo, even though the time was more than enough, because he wanted to be alone with his thoughts. He knew the time, the time when Valentine, after seeing Nortier have lunch, was sure that she would not be disturbed in this pious duty. Nortier and Valentine had allowed him two visits a week, and he was going to take advantage of his right. Valentine was waiting for him when he arrived. Anxious, almost distracted, she grasped his hand and led him to her grandfather's. Her anxiety, as we have said, had ridden, has ri has had risen almost to the pitch of distraction, the result of the rumours that were circulating about Morcerf's adventure. People knew 
as people in society always do, about what had happened at the opera. At the V-Force, no one doubted that a duel would inevitably result from this scandal. Valentine, with her woman's instinct, had guessed that Morel would be Monte Cristo's second, and, knowing the young man's courage and his firm friendship with the Count, was she was afraid that he would not have the strength to confine himself to the passive role implied by this. So, one can well understand how eagerly the story was asked for, told and heard, and Morel read unspeakable joy in his beloved's eyes when she knew that this dreadful business had ended in a way that was as fortunate as it was unexpected. Now, Valentine said to Morel, motioning him to sit beside the old man, and herself sitting on the stool on which he was resting his feet. Now, let's talk a bit about our own business. You know, Maximilien, that my grandfather was thinking for a time of leaving this house and taking an, uh, taking an apartment somewhere else. Yes, I do, said Maximilien. I remember the plan very well, and I strongly approved of it. Well, you can continue to approve, Maximilien, because my grandfather has come back to the idea. Bravo, said Maximilien. And do you know why he says he is leaving this house? Nortier looked at his granddaughter to urge her to silence, but Valentine was not looking at Nortier. Her eyes, her look, her smile were all for Morel. Oh, whatever reason Monsieur Nortier gives, Morel said, I'm sure it's very good. Very good, said Valentine. He says that the air of the Faubourg Saint-Honoré is not beneficial to me. Perhaps so, said Morel. Listen, Valentine, Monsieur Nortier could be right. I feel that you haven't been well for the past two weeks. Yes, not very, it's true, Valentine answered. So, Grandfather has become my doctor, and as he knows everything, I have great confidence in him. But is it true, then, that you are not well, Valentine? Morel asked anxiously. Oh, heavens, no! It's not what you would call being ill. I, I just don't feel very well, that's at all, that's all. My appetite is gone, and I feel that my stomach has to struggle to take anything in. Nortier did not miss one of Valentine's words. And what course of treatment are you following for this unknown illness? Very simple, said Valentine. Every morning I drink a spoonful of the potion they bring for Grandfather. When I say a spoonful, I started with one, and now I have reached four. My grandfather pretends it's a panacea. Valentine smiled, but there was something sad and pained in her smile. Maximilien, intoxicated with love, looked at her in silence. She was very beautiful, but her pallor had a duller tone. Her eyes shone with, le with a less ardent flame than usual, and her hands, normally white like mother, and mother of pearl, looked like wax hands, which, with time, were acquiring a hint of yellow. From Valentine, the young man looked at Nortier. The latter was staring at the young woman, who was absorbed in her love, with that strange and deep understanding that he had. But he too, like Morel, was examining these traces of silent suffering, even though they were so faint as to have escaped every eye except those of the lover and the grandfather. But this medicine of which you are now taking four spoonfuls, said Morel, wasn't it prescribed for Monsieur Nortier? I, I know it is very bitter, said Valentine, so bitter that anything I drink afterwards seems to have the same taste. Nortier looked at her questioningly. Yes, grandfather, said Valentine, that's how it is. Just now, before coming down to see you, I drank a glass of sugar water, and had to leave half of it, so bitter did it seem to me. Nortier went pale, and indicated that he wished to speak. Valentine got up to look for the dictionary, and Nortier's eyes followed her with obvious anxiety. And indeed, the blood was rising to the young woman's head, and her cheeks were flushed. That, that's odd she said, as light-hearted as ever. Very odd. I feel faint. Have I caught the sun? 
and she supported herself on the window catch. There is no sun, Morel said, more worried by the expression on Nortier's face than by Valentine's indisposition in itself. He ran across to her. She smiled. Don't worry, dear grandfather, she said, and you, Maximilien, don't worry. It's nothing. I feel better already. But listen, isn't that the sound of a carriage coming into the courtyard? She opened Nortier's door and went quickly over to a window in the corridor, then hurried back. Yes, she said. It's Madame Danglars and her daughter who have come to visit us. Oh, goodbye. I must go or they will come and look for me here. Or rather, au revoir. Stay with Grandfather, Maximilien. I promise not to keep them long. Morel watched her go out and closed the door, then heard her going up the little staircase which led to both Madame de Villefort's, uh, Mademoiselle de Villefort's room, Madame de Villefort's room and her own. As soon as she had vanished, Nortier indicated to him that he should take down the dictionary. Morel did so. Under Valentine's guidance, he had quickly learnt to understand the old man. Yet, despite his familiarity with the procedure, since it was necessary to go through some, some at least of the 24 letters of the alphabet and find each word in the dictionary, it was ten minutes before the invalid's thoughts had been translated into these words, fetch the glass and the jug from Valentine's room. Morel immediately rang for the servant who had replaced Barrois and gave him the order in Nortier's name. The man came back a moment later. The jug and glass were entirely empty. Nortier showed that he wanted to speak. Why are the glass and jug empty? he asked. Valentine said that she had only drunk half a glass. This new inquiry took a further five minutes to convey. I don't know, the servant said, but the chambermaid is in Mademoiselle Valentine's apartments. Uh, perhaps she emptied them. Ask her, Morel said this time translating Nortier's thoughts from a look. The servant went out and returned almost immediately. Uh, Mademoiselle Valentine went through her room on her way to Madame de Villefort's, he said. As she went because she was thirsty, she drank what remained in the glass. As for the jug, Master Edouard emptied it to make a pond for his ducks. Nortier turned his eyes to heaven as a player might when he is staking his all on a single throw. After that, he looked at the door and remained staring in that direction. As Valentine had thought, it was Madame Danglars and her daughter whom she had seen arriving. They were shown into Madame de Villefort's room, where she said she would receive them. This is why Valentine went through her own apartments. Her room was on a level with her mother-in-law's, the two being separated only by that of Edouard. The women came into the drawing room with that sort of formal stiffness that presages an announcement. This kind of nuance is quickly picked up by those who move in the same circles, and Madame de Villefort replied to their solemnity in kind. Then Valentine came in, and the curtsies were performed over again. My dear friend, the Baroness said, while the two girls took each other's hands. I have come with Eugenie to be the first to announce you to my daughter's forthcoming marriage with Prince Cavalcanti. Danglars had clung to the title of Prince. The people's banker felt that it sounded better than Count. Then allow me to compliment you most sincerely, Madame de Villefort replied. Prince Cavalcanti seems to be a young man of very, of many rare qualities. The Baroness smiled. Talking as friend to friend, she said, I have to tell you that the prince does not seem to us what he will eventually become. He has some of that strangeness that allows us French to recognise an Italian or German aristocrat at first glance, yet he appears to have a very good heart and a ready wit. As for compatibility, Monsieur Danglars claims that his fortune is majestic. That's his own word. And then... Eugenie said, leafing through Madame de Villefort's album, You must admit, Madame, that you, your, you have yourself taken a fancy to the young man. I don't have to ask if you share that predilection, said Madame de Villefort. Ha! said Eugenie with her usual self-assurance. 
Not in the slightest, madame. It never was my vocation to tie myself down to household chores or the whim of a man, whoever he might be. My vocation was to be an artist, free in heart, body and thought. Eugenie spoke these words in such firm and ringing tones that Valentine blushed. The timid young woman could not comprehend this energetic creature who seemed to have none of the diffidence of a woman. In any case, she went on, since I am destined to be married, whether I like it or not, I can thank Providence for showering me with the contempt of Monsieur Albert de Morcerf, because without it I should now be the wife of a dishonoured man. That's true enough said the Baroness, with that odd naivety that is sometimes found among aristocratic women, and which even associating with their inferiors does not entirely dispel. It's true. If the Morcerfs had not held back, my daughter would have married that Monsieur Albert. The General was very keen on it. He even came to compel Monsieur Danglars to conclude the match. We had a narrow escape. But surely, Valentine said shyly, does all the shame of the father rebound on the son? Monsieur Albert seems to me quite innocent of the general's treachery. Oh, please, my dear friend, said the inflexible young woman. Monsieur Albert claims his share and deserves it. It appears that after provoking Monsieur de Monte Cristo yesterday at the opera, he this morning apologised to him on the field. Impossible, said Madame de Vifort. Oh, my dear, no said Madame Danglars, with the same naivety we mentioned. It's an established fact. I have it from Monsieur de Bray, who was there when the confrontation took place. Valentine also knew the truth, but she did not reply. A word had taken her back into her own thoughts, and she was imagining herself in Nortier's room where Morel was waiting for her. For some time, lost in this sort of inner meditation, she ceased to take any part in the conversation. It would even have been impossible for her to repeat what had been said over the past few, past few minutes, when suddenly Madame Danglars's hand, touching her arm, shook her out of her reverie. "'What is it, madame?' Valentine said, shuddering at the touch of Madame Danglars's fingers as she might at an electric shock. "'It's you, my dear Valentine,' said the Baroness. "'You are feeling ill?' I, "'I am?' the young woman touched her burning forehead. "'Yes, look at yourself in that mirror. "'In the last minute you have blushed, then paled three or four times.' "'Yes, indeed,' Eugenie exclaimed. "'You're very pale.' "'Oh, don't worry, Eugenie. "'I've been like this for some days.' and, guileless though she was, she guessed that this might be an opportunity to leave. In any event, Madame de Vifort came to her assistance, saying, "'You had better go and lie down, Valentine. As you really are ill, these ladies will excuse you. Have a glass of pure water and it'll make you feel better.' Valentine kissed Eugenie, curtsied to Madame Danglars, who had already got up to leave, and went out. "'Poor child,' Madame de Vifort said when Valentine had gone. "'I'm very concerned about her. "'I should not be surprised if there were not something seriously wrong with her.' "'However, Valentine, in a sort of exhilaration of which she was barely aware herself, "'had passed through Edouard's room without replying to some spiteful remark from the child, "'and hurried through her own room to the little staircase. "'She had gone down all the steps but the last three and could already hear Morel's voice, when suddenly her eyes clouded, her foot stiffened and missed the step, step, her hands no longer had the strength to support her, and, leaning against the wall, she fell rather than walked down the last three steps. Morel rushed to the door, opened it, and found Valentine stretched out on the landing. In an instant he lifted her under her, lifted her, under her arms and put her down in a chair. Her eyes opened. "'How clumsy I am,' she said, the words tumbling feverishly out. "'Don't I know how to stand up? "'I forgot there were three steps to the landing. "'Oh, my God! "'Heavens above, Valentine, haven't you hurt yourself?' "'Marelle cried. "'Valentine looked around. "'She saw the most profound anxiety in Nortier's eyes. 
Have no fear, Grandfather, she said, trying to smile. It's nothing, it's nothing. I, I just felt a little faint, that's all. Another dizzy spell, Morel said, clasping his hands. Please take heed, Valentine, I beg you. No, no, said Valentine. No, I told you, it is gone and it was nothing. Now, let me give you some news. In a week Eugenie is to be getting married, and in three days there will be a kind of great feast to celebrate the betrothal. We are all invited, my father, Madame de Villefort, and I, at, at least as I understand. So when will it be our turn to think about that sort of thing? Oh, Valentine, you have so much influence with your grandfather. Try to make him say soon. You expect me to hurry things along and awaken Grandfather's memory? She asked. Yes, Morel said. Oh, for goodness sake, be quick. Until the moment when you are mine, Valentine, I shall always be afraid of losing you. Oh, truly, Maximilien, she said with a convulsive movement. You are too fearful for an officer, for a soldier who, they say, has never known fear. <laughs> and she burst into a strident and painful laugh. Then her arms stiffened and turned, her head fell back in the chair, and she remained motionless. The cry of terror that God brought to Nortier's lips blazed out from his eyes. Morel understood. They must call for assistance. He tugged at the bell, and the chambermaid who was in Valentine's apartments and the servant who had replaced Barois hurried in simultaneously. Valentine was so pale, so cold and so lifeless, that, without listening to what they were told, seized by the terror that constantly hovered about that accursed house, they rushed out into the corridors, crying for help. Madame Danglars and Eugenie were just leaving, but they still had time to discover the cause of all the commotion. "'Just as I said!' Madame de Vifor exclaimed. "'Poor child!' Chapter 94 A Confession At the same moment, Monsieur de Vifor's voice was heard shouting from his study, "'What's the matter?' Morel exchanged glances with Nortier, who had recovered his composure, and, with a glance, pointed him towards the closet in which he had already concealed himself on a similar previous occasion. He had just had, he just had time to pick up his hat and jump inside, panting for breath. The Crown Prosecutor's footsteps could be heard in the corridor. Vifor hurried into the room, ran over to Valentine, and took her in his arms. "'A doctor! A doctor!' he cried. "'Get Monsieur d'Arvigny! Or, rather, I'll go myself!' He hurried out of the apartment. Morel hastened out through the other door. He had just been struck by the most appalling recollection. He remembered the conversation between Vifor and the doctor, which he had overheard on the night when Madame de Saint-Marin died. The symptoms, though in a milder form, were the same as the ones had that had preceded the death of Barois. At the same time, he heard Monte Cristo's voice in his ear saying, as he had barely two hours earlier, Whatever you need, Morel, come to me. I have a great deal of power. So, swifter than thought, he hurried from the Faubourg Saint Honoré to the Rue de Matignon, and from the Rue de Matignon to the Avenue de Champs Élysées. In the meanwhile, Monsieur de Vifort had arrived in his hired cab at Monsieur d'Avrigny's door. He rang so violently that the concierge ran to open with a look of terror. Vifor rushed up the stairs without being able to say anything. The concierge knew him and let him go by, merely shouting after him, In his consulting room, monsieur, in his consulting room. Vifor was already opening, or rather crashing through, the door of the room. Ah, oh, it's you, the doctor said. Yes, doctor, Vifor said, closing the door behind him. Now it is my turn to ask if you ask you if we are quite alone. Doctor, my house is accursed. What? the doctor said, disguising the welter of feelings inside him under an appearance of calm. Has someone else been taken ill? Yes, doctor, Vifor cried, plunging his hands with a convulsive movement into his hair. 
Yes. Davrenis look said, I warned you. Then his lips slowly spoke these words. So, who is going to die in your house? And what new victim will accuse us of weakness before God? V4 gave a painful sob. He went over to the doctor and clasped his arm. Valentine, he said. It's the turn of Valentine. Your daughter? Davrenie exclaimed, overcome with distress and surprise. You see, you were wrong, the lawyer muttered. Come, come and see her on her bed of pain. Ask her forgiveness for suspecting her. Every time you have called me in, it has been too late, said Monsieur Davrenie. No matter, I'm on my way. But, Monsieur, we must hurry. With the enemies who strike at your family, there is no time to be lost. Ah, this time, Doctor, you will not reproach me for my weakness. This time I shall find the murderer and strike. Let's us try to save the victim before we think about revenge, said Davrigny. Come on. And the cab that had brought Vifort took him, and took him and Davrigny back at full speed, at the very moment when Morel, for his part, was knocking at Monte Cristo's door. The Count was in his study. Bertuccio had just sent him a note, and he was reading it with some anxiety. When the valet announced Morel, who had left him barely two hours earlier, the Count looked up. Clearly a good deal had happened to him, as it had to the Count in those two hours, because the young man, who had left with a smile on his lips, was returning in a state of visible disarray. The Count got up and hurried to meet him. "'What is wrong, Maximilien?' he asked. "'You are quite pale, and your forehead is bathed in sweat.' Morel fell rather than sat down in a chair. "'Yes,' he said. "'I have been hurrying. I needed to speak to you urgently.' Is everyone well in your family? The Count asked with an unmissably, un unmistakably sincere note of affectionate goodwill. Yes, thank you, thank you, Count. And the young man replied, clearly at a loss to know how to open the conversation. Yes, yes, in my family everyone is well. Good, but, but you have something to tell me? The Count asked, more and more anxious. Yes, and it's true I have just hurried to see you from a house which has been touched by the arrival of death. Have you been to Monsieur de Morcerf's, then? Monte Cristo asked. No, Morel said. H has someone died at Monsieur de Morcerf's? The general has just blown his brains out. Oh, what a terrible thing! Maximilien exclaimed. Not for the Countess or Albert, Monte Cristo said. Better a husband and father dead than a husband and father dishonoured. The blood will wash away the same. Poor Countess. She is the one I pity most. Such a noble woman. Pity Albert as well, Maximilien. Believe me, he is a worthy son of his mother. But let's return to you. You have hurried round to see me, you say. Might I have the happiness of being able to help you? Yes, I need you. That is to say, like a madman, I, I believe that you could help me in a case where, in fact, only God can do so. Tell me even so, said Monte Cristo. I, I don't know if I am entitled to reveal such a secret to human ears, said Morel, but fate drives me to it, and necessity obliges me, Count. He hesitated. Do you believe in my affection for you? Monte Cristo said, clasping the young man's hand in his. Oh, you are encouraging me, and, and something here, Morel put his hand on his heart, tells me that I should have no secrets from you. You are right, Morel. God speaks to your heart and your heart to you. Tell me what your heart is telling you. Count, will you let me send Baptistin to ask, on your behalf, for news of someone you know? I have put myself at your disposal, so my servants are all the more yours to command. I shall not live until I am certain that she is recovering. Shall I ring for Baptistin? No, let me talk to him myself. Morel went out, called, da ba called Baptistin, and whispered a few words to him. The valet left at the double. Well, is that done then? Monte Cristo asked when he returned. 
Yes, and I can breathe a little easier. You know I am waiting, Monte Cristo said with a smile. Yes, yes, and I will tell you. Listen, one evening I was in a garden, hidden by a clump of trees, so that no one guessed I was there. Two people walked close to me. Please allow me not to tell you their names for the time being. They were talking very quietly together, but I was so interested to hear what they were saying that I did not miss a word. This is not going to be a happy tale, to judge by the colour of your cheeks and the shudder you gave. No, it is a dismal one, my friend. Someone, has, someone had just died in the house of the man who owned the garden where I was hiding. The owner was one of the two people whose conversation I heard. The other was the doctor. The former was telling the latter about his anxieties and his fears, because this was the second time in a month that death had struck, speedily and unexpectedly, in this family. You might think that it had been singled out by an exterminating angel to suffer the wrath of God. Ah, said Monte Cristo, staring at the young man and imperceptibly turning his chair so that he was in shadow while the light shone full on Maximilien's face. Yes, the latter went on. Death had struck this family twice within a month. And what was the doctor's reply? Monte Cristo asked. He, he replied, he replied that the death was not natural, that it was attributable to, to what? T to poison. Really? said Monte Cristo, with a little cough that, at times when he was profoundly moved by something, allowed him to disguise a blush, a loss of colour, or even the attention with which he was listening. Really, Maximilian, did you hear that? Yes, my dear Count, I, I did hear it, and the doctor added that, if such a thing should occur again, he would feel himself obliged to call in the law. Monte Cristo listened, or appeared to do so with the greatest calm. Then, said Maximilian, death struck a third time, and neither the master of the house nor the doctor said anything. Death may strike a fourth time, perhaps. Count, what obligation do you think knowing this secret imposes on me? My dear friend, Monte Cristo answered, you seem to be telling a story that each of us knows by heart. I know the house where you overheard that conversation, or at least one very similar, a house with a garden, a father and a doctor, a house in which there have been three peculiar and unexpected deaths. Well, consider me. I have not overheard any confidences, yet I know all of this as well as you do. Do I have any scruples of conscience? No, it doesn't concern me. You say that an exterminating angel seems to have designated this family for the wrath of God. Well, who tells you that what seems to be is not the case? You should not see things that those who have good reason to see them fail to see. If it is justice and not God's wrath that hovers about that house, Maximilien, turn away and let divine justice proceed. Morel shuddered. There was something at once dismal, solemn and fearsome in the Count's voice. In any case, he said, with such a sudden change in his tone that one could not have thought the words came from the same man's lips. Who tells you that it will occur again? It has, Count, Morel cried. That is why I have come to see you. Well, what can I do, Morel? Do you by any chance want me to inform the Crown Prosecutor? These last words were spoken with such clarity and emphasis that Morel leapt to his feet and exclaimed, Count! You know whom I mean, don't you? Of course I do, my dear friend, and I will prove it to you by dotting the I's and giving names to the people. You were walking one evening in Monsieur de Vifort's garden. According to your account, I suppose it must have been on the evening when Madame de Saint-Marin died. You heard Monsieur de Vifort speaking to Monsieur d'Avrigny about Monsieur de Saint-Marin's death and the no less unexpected death of the Marquise. Monsieur d'Avrigny said that he believed one, or even both of them, had been poisoned. And you, the most law-abiding of men, have been wandering ever since, searching your heart and sounding your conscience to decide whether you should reveal the secret or not. 
We are no longer in the Middle Ages, my dear fellow, and there is no longer any holy them or franc juge. What the devil are you going to ask these people? Conscience, what do you want of me, as Stern says? No, my friend, let them sleep if they are sleeping. Let them go grey with insomnia, and for you, for the love of God, sleep, since you have no pangs of conscience to keep you awake. A look of unspeakable anguish appeared on Morel's face. He grasped Monte Cristo's hand. But it has started again, I tell you. So? said the Count, astonished at this insistence, which he could not understand, and looking closely at Maximilien. <laughs> Let it start again. It's a family of Atreides. God has condemned them and they will suffer their fate. They will disappear like the houses of cards that children set up, which fall one by one when their builders blow on them, and would do so even if there were two hundred of them. Three months ago it was Monsieur de Saint-Marin, two months ago Madame de Saint-Marin, the other day it was Barrois, and today it will be Old Nortier or Young Valentine. You knew? Morel cried in such a paroxysm of terror that even Monte Cristo, who, could, who would have watched the sky fall without blanching, shuddered. You knew and said nothing. Why, what does it matter to me? The Count said, shrugging his shoulders. Do I know these people? Must I destroy one to save another? Good Lord, no, because between the guilty party and the victim I have absolutely no preference. But I do! Morel shouted in agony. I do! I love her! Whom do you love? cried Monte Cristo, leaping to his feet and clasping the two hands which Morel was lifting entwined to heaven. I love passionately, I love madly, I love like a man who would give his life's blood to spare her a tear. I love Valentine de Vifor, who is being murdered at this moment. Do you understand? I love her, and I beg God and you to tell me how I can save her. Monte Cristo gave a savage cry, which can only be imagined by those who have heard the roar of a wounded lion. Wretch! he cried, wringing his hands in his turn. Wretch! You love Valentine? You love that daughter of an accursed race? Morel had never seen such an expression. Never had such a fearful eye blazed up before his face, and never had the spirit of terror which he had so often seen appear, either on the battlefield or in the murderous Algerian night, fanned such sinister flames around him. He shrank back in horror. As for Monte Cristo, after this outburst he closed his eyes for a moment, as if dazzled by some inner lightning. During that moment, he collected himself with such force that one could gradually see his chest cease to heave with the inner storms that shook it, as the raging and foaming of the sea is appeased when the clouds disperse and the sun shines out again. This silence, this inner struggle, lasted for some twenty seconds. Then the Count raised his pale face. You, you see? he said in a strained voice. See how, my dear friend, how God punishes the most boastful and the most detached of men for their indifference to the frightful scenes that he displays before them. I, who was watching the unfolding of this dreadful tragedy as an impassive and curious spectator, I, who like the fallen angel, laughed at the evil that men do when they are sheltered by secrecy, and secrecy is easy to preserve for the rich and powerful, now I myself am bitten by that serpent whose progress I was observing, bitten to the heart. Morel gave a dull moan. Come now, the Count said. No more sighs. Be a man, be strong, be full of hope, for I am here watching over you. Morel sadly shook his head. Don't you understand? I told you to hope, cried Monte Cristo. Learn this. I never lie. I am never wrong. It's midday, Maximilien. Give thanks to heaven that you came at midday and not this evening or tomorrow morning. Listen to what I am about to tell you, Morel. It is midday, and if Valentine is not dead now, she will not die. Oh, my God! My God! Morel cried, and I left her dying. Monte Cristo put a hand to his forehead. 
What was going on inside that head, so heavy with its terrible secrets? What were the angel of light and the angel of darkness saying to that mind, at once implacable and humane? Only God knew. Monte Cristo looked up once more, and this time he was as calm as a child waking from sleep. Maximilien, he said, go quietly back home. I order you to not do anything, not to try any approach, not let the shadow of a single worry cloud your face. I shall have news for you. Now go. My God, said Morel, you terrify me, Count, with your lack of emotion. Have you some remedy for death? Are you more than a man? Are you an angel, a god? And the young man, who had never flinched from any danger, shrank away from Monte Cristo, seized with unspeakable terror. However, Monte Cristo was looking at him with a smile that was, was at once so melancholy and so tender that Maximilien felt the tears filling his eyes. I can do many things, friend, the Count replied. Go now. I need to be alone. So Morel, subjugated by the powerful ascendancy that Monte Cristo exercised over everything around him, did not even try to object. He shook the Count's hand and left. But at the door he stopped to wait for Baptistin, whom he had just seen running round the corner of the Rue Matignon. In the meantime, Vifor and Davrigny had hurried home. When they got there, Valentine was still unconscious, and the doctor examined his patient with, with the care demanded by the circumstances, and an attentiveness made all the more minute by his knowledge of the secret. Vifor, hanging on his every look and word, awaited the outcome of the examination. Nortier, paler than the girl herself, even more eager to find a solution than Vifor, was also waiting, everything about him expressing intelligence and sensitivity. At last, Davrigny said slowly, she's still alive. Still? Vifor exclaimed. Oh, doctor, what a dreadful word that is. Yes, the doctor said, and I repeat, she is still alive, and I am very surprised by it. But is she saved? The father asked. Yes, since she is alive. At that moment, Davrigny's eye caught that of Nothier, which shone with, with such astonishing joy and such a rich abundance of ideas that the doctor was quite struck by it. He lowered the girl onto the chair. Her lips were so pale and white, like the rest of her face, as to be barely distinguishable. Then he stayed motionless, watching Nortier, who was waiting and observing each of the doctor's movements. Monsieur, Davrigny said to Vifor, call Mademoiselle Valentine's chambermaid, if you please. Vifor laid down his daughter's head, which he had been supporting, and went in person to call the chambermaid. As soon as he had closed the door, Davrigny went over to Nortier. Do you have something to tell me? he asked. The old man blinked expressively. It was, as we have said, the only affirmative sign that he had at his disposal. To me alone? Yes, Nortier affirmed. Very well, I shall remain with you. At that moment, V4 returned, followed by the chambermaid. Behind her came Madame de Vifor. But what has happened to this dear child? she asked. She has just left me, and she did complain that she was not feeling well, but I could not believe it was serious. And with tears in her eyes, and with every mark of affection of a true mother, the young woman crossed to Valentine and took her hand. Davrigny was still watching Nortier. He saw the old man's eyes dilate and grow round, his cheeks drain of colour and start to tremble. There was sweat on his brow. Ah, Davrigny said involuntarily, following Nortier's eyes towards Madame de Vifor, who was saying, This poor child will be better lying down. Come, Fanny, we must take her to her bed. Monsieur Davrigny saw in this suggestion a means to stay alone with Nortier, and nodded to show that this was indeed the best thing to do, but forbade them to give the patient anything at all except what he would prescribe for her. Valentine was taken away, 
having regained consciousness but still unable to make any movement or virtually to speak, so grave had been the effect of the shock on her limbs. However, she did muster the strength to greet her grandfather with a look, and, as they took her away, it seemed as though they were tearing out his soul. Davreny followed the patient, finished giving his instructions, and told Vifort to take a cab and go in person to the pharmacists to have the preparations made up in front of him, then to bring them back and wait for him in his daughter's room. Finally, after repeating his order that Valentine should not be allowed to take anything, he went back down to Nortier's, carefully closed the doors, and after making sure that they could not be overheard, said, Now, do you know something about your granddaughter's illness? Yes, the old man affirmed. Listen, we have no time to lose. I am going to question you and you will answer me. Nortier indicated that he was ready to reply. Did you foresee what was going to happen what happened to Valentine today? Yes. Davreny thought for a moment, then came closer to Nortier and added, Excuse me for what I am about to say, but no clue must be overlooked in the present frightful circumstances. Did you see poor Barrois die? Nortier looked heavenwards. Do you know what he died of? Davreny asked, putting a hand on Nortier's shoulder. Yes, the old man replied. Do you think his death was natural? Something like a smile appeared on Nortier's paralysed lips. So the idea has occurred to you that Barrois was poisoned? Yes. Do you think that the poison that killed him was intended for him? No. Now, do you think that the same hand which struck Barrois down, intending to strike at someone else, has now struck Valentine? Yes. Will she also succumb to it? Daphne asked, looking attentively at Nortier. He was waiting to see the effect of the question on the old man. No, the latter replied, with an air of triumph that could have refuted the prophecies of the most skilled soothsayer. So you are hopeful, Daphne said in surprise. Yes. What are you hoping for? The old man indicated with a look that he could not reply to such a question. Ah, of course, Daphne muttered. Then, turning back to Nortier, he said, Do you hope that the murderer will give up trying? No. Then you hope that the poison will not affect Valentine? Yes. Because I am not revealing anything to you, am I, when I tell you that someone has tried to poison her? The invalid showed that he had no doubt on that subject. So how do you hope that Valentine will escape? Nortier kept his eyes obstinately fixed in one direction. Daphne followed them and saw that they were settled on the bottle containing the potion that he brought every morning. Ah, I see, said Daphne, suddenly understanding. Did you have the idea... Nortier did not let him finish. Yes, he said. The idea of forearming her against the poison? Yes. By accustoming her little accustoming her little by little. Yes, yes, said Nortier, delighted at being understood. In short, you learned that there was brucine in the potions which I had been giving you. Yes. So by accustoming her to this poison, you hoped to neutralize the effects of the poison. The same triumphant joy on Nortier's face. Well you succeeded. Daphne exclaimed. Without that, Valentine would be dead today. Murdered without any possible protection. Murdered without mercy. The shock was considerable, but she has only been shaken. And this time, at least, Valentine will not die. A supreme ray of joy lit the old man's eyes, which he turned heavenwards with a look of infinite gratitude. At that moment, Vifor returned. Here you are, Doctor, he said. This is what you requested. Was it prepared in front of you? Yes, the Crown Prosecutor replied. It has not left your hands? No. Davreny took the bottle and poured out a few drops of the liquid it contained into the palm of his hand, then swallowed it. Very well, he said. Let's go up to Valentine's. 
I shall give my instructions to everyone, and you will be personally responsible, Monsieur de Villefort, for ensuring that no one disobeys them. As Daphrenie was entering Valentine's room, accompanied by Madame Monsieur de Villefort, an Italian priest, stern in manner, calm and firm of speech, rented the house next door to the mansion inhabited by Monsieur de Villefort. It was impossible to know exactly what persuaded the three tenants of the house to move out two hours later, but the rumour that went round the district was that the house was not solidly fixed on its foundations and was threatening to collapse. However, this did not prevent the new tenant from settling in with his modest furnishings at around five o'clock on the very same day. Elise was taken out for three, six or nine years by the new tenant who, in accordance with a custom established by the landlords, paid six months in advance. This new tenant, who, as we have said, was Italian, was named Signor Giacomo Bussoni. Workmen were immediately summoned and the very same night the few passers-by who stopped at the top end of the Faubourg were surprised to see carpenters and builders shoring up the foundations of the unsteady building. And I think there we shall take a break. I love the fact that it's like, so I'm going to help with the thing? How are you going to help? I'm going to rent the building next door. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, but yes, hello everybody who has come in. We shall now take a quick break um, and see you back in about five minutes. Bye for now. <laughs>
the back. Are the volumes messing up? The music is much louder than the reading was. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Guess I, I shall, uh, I shall have to turn that down. Uh, on the break. Thank you for flagging that up. Um, but yes, uh, welcome in those of you who who were uh, who appeared. Uh, Thunder. Stick of the dump. Ah, oh, that's a book that I remember reading a lot when I was a kid. Stick of the dump was great. Also, is it your birthday? Did I see? Happy birthday! Happy birthday, Thunder. Um, also, welcome in Molophant and Kitarcat. I hope you are both well. And yes, um, do feel free to use all of our fancy, fancy schmancy new emotes, as beautifully demonstrated there by my glamorous assistant, um, Mr. Dali Sam. Um, and yeah. I hope everybody has had a good break. I have got myself a cup of tea. Um and it's 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 already starting to feel a little bit autumnal with with the with the rain and like there's, there's like mist outside and it's dark now but there was mist earlier. Um so yeah, I'd like I, I don't really want summer to go yet, but I I I kind of I kind of I'm not I'm not mad about like getting autumn in. That's, that's that'll be fine. Um, but uh, but yes, shall we continue? Um, just checking how many chapters. You're not ready for summer to go yet. Nah, I'll, I'll I'd take a bit longer of, of summer and then and then I'll be very ready for autumn. I think. Uh, yeah, just having a look where I can stop. Probably a couple more chapters. I reckon <clears throat> my voice is a little bit tired. Uh, given that I have been doing some more recordings ooh, 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 for putting on our band camp, which will will we will we will talk about when it's kind of ready to to get set up and stuff. Um, but yes, soon keep your eyes peeled for um, like no cat interruption, no messing up words, um, more professional uh, streams. She says, um, about five times here. Um, coming up so that you can, you can buy, a, oh God, I'm not doing well with words, that you can um, pay a monthly subscription and you get a nice big, well, not very big, you get an album of stories, basically. An album? I don't know. A collection of stories each month um, that are more professionally done. They are ones we have already read, um, but yes, anyway, anyway. That that'll I will talk about that more. Or Sam will talk about that more when it's up and ready to be stuffed. I don't know. As I said, tired and brain melting. So anyway, shall we continue? Chapter ninety five, father and daughter. In the previous chapter, we heard Madame Danglars officially announce to Madame de Vifort the forthcoming marriage of Mademoiselle Eugénie Danglars with Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. This formal announcement, announcement, which indicated, or appeared to do so, a resolution taken by all parties involved in this great matter, had however been preceded by a scene which we owe it to our readers to inform them about. Inform them about. We beg them, in consequence, to step back in time with us and to transport themselves, on the very morning of this day which was to be marked by such great catastrophes, to the finely gilded drawing-room to which we have already introduced them, the pride and joy of its owner, Baron Danglars. At around ten o'clock in the morning, the Baron himself was pacing up and down in this drawing-room, thoughtful and visibly anxious, pausing at every sound and looking at every door. When his store of patience was exhausted, he called the valet. Etienne, he said, pray go and in pray go and inquire why Mademoiselle Eugenie asked me to wait in the drawing room, and discover why she was making me wait so long. The Baron calmed down a little after blowing off this petulant excuse me, petulant blast. Mademoiselle Danglars, after waking up, had indeed sent to ask for an audience with her father appointing the gilt drawing-room as the venue for this meeting. 
the banker was not a little surprised by the oddness of the request, particularly by its formal nature, but immediately comp complied with his daughter's wishes by being the first to arrive in the room. Etienne soon returned from his mission. Mademoiselle's chambermaid, he said, informed me that Mademoiselle was completing her toilet and would not be long in coming. Danglars nodded to show he was satisfied. In the eyes of the world, and even in those of his servants, Danglars played the indulgent father and good-natured fellow. This was one side of the part he had chosen for himself in the popular comedy he was playing, an appearance, an appearance he had taken on which seemed to suit him as it suited the right profile of one of those masks worn by the fathers of the theatre in antiquity to have the lips turned upwards and smiling, while on the left side the lips were turned down and sorrowful. We might add that, in his family circle, the smiling upturned lips dropped and became downturned and dismal ones, so that most of the time the good-natured fellow vanished, giving way to a brutal husband and tyrannical father. "'Why the devil, if the silly goose wants to talk to me, as she claims?' Danglars muttered. "'Can't she just come to my study? And why does she want to talk to me?' He was turning this irksome question around in his head for the twentieth time when the door opened and Eugenie appeared, wearing a dress of black satin embroidered with velvety flowers of the same colour, with her hair put up and her arms encased in gloves, as though she were going to her box in the Théâtre Italienne. "'Now, Eugenie, what's the matter?' her father exclaimed. "'And why do we have to be formal in the drawing-room when it's so much more comfortable in my private study?' "'You are perfectly right, monsieur,' said Eugenie, motioning to her father that he, that he could sit down. "'You have just asked two questions which sum up the whole of the conversation we are about to have. "'I shall therefore answer both of them, and, contrary to custom, the second first, as it is simpler. "'I chose the drawing-room, monsieur, as the venue for our meeting, "'to escape from the disagreeable impressions in the atmosphere of a banker's study.' Those account registers, however well gilded, those drawers shut tight like the gates of a fortress, those piles of banknotes that come from heaven knows where, those masses of letters from England, Holland, Spain, the Indies, China or Peru, all have a peculiar effect on the mind of a father and make him forget that there is in the world something greater and more sacred than social standing or the opinion of his investors. So I chose this drawing-room, where you can see your portrait, mine and my mother's, smiling and happy in their magnificent frames, as well as all sorts of pastoral landscapes and charming scenes of shepherds and shepherdesses. I attach great importance to the effect of external impressions. This may perhaps be a mistake, especially where you are concerned, but what do you expect? I should not be an artist if I did not indulge in a few fancies. "'Very well,' said Monsieur Danglars, who had been listening to this diatribe with utter imperturbability, but not understanding a word of it, because, like every man who is full of ulterior motives, he was preoccupied with finding his own train of thought in the speaker's ideas. "'So, there we have the second point more or less cleared, more or less cleared up,' said Eugenie, quite undisturbed, expressing, as usual, an entirely masculine composure in her words and gestures. And you appear to be satisfied with the explanation. Now, to return to the first point. You ask me why I wanted this talk. Let me put it very briefly, monsieur. I do not want to marry Count Andrea Cavalcanti. Danglars leapt out of his seat. The shock of his descent back threw his arms in the air and cast his eyes heavenwards. Yes, monsieur, there you have it, said Eugenie, still quite unmoved. I can see you are surprised, because, since this whole business started, I have not shown the slightest objection, being sure that, when the moment came, I would always frankly and absolutely express my opposition to people who do not consult me in things which I do not like. This time, however, this calm, this passivity, as philosophers say, originated elsewhere. It came from the fact that, as a submissive and devoted daughter, a faint smile appeared on the young woman's crimson lips, I was trying the path of obedience. Well, said Danglars, 
Well, monsieur, Eugenie went on, I tried. I tried with all my strength, and now that the moment has come, despite all the efforts I have made over myself, I feel unable to obey. But tell me, said Danglars, an inferior mind who seemed at first quite bewildered by the weight of this pitiless logic, stated with a coolness that argued so much premeditation and strength of will, what is the reason for this refusal, Eugenie? What, what is the reason? The reason, the young woman replied, good Lord, it's not because the man is uglier, stupider or more disagreeable than any other. No, for those who consider a man from the point of view of his face and figure, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti might even pass as quite a fine model. And it's not because my heart is any less moved by him than by another. That sort of answer would do for a schoolgirl, but I consider it quite beneath me. I love absolutely no one, Monsieur. You know that, don't you? So you, I cannot see why, unless forced to do so, I should wish to encumber my life with an eternal companion. Didn't the sage say somewhere, nothing in excess, and elsewhere, carry everything with you? I was even taught those two aphorisms in Latin and Greek. One is from Phaedrus, I believe, the other from Bias. Well, my dear father, in the shipwreck of life, for life is an eternal shipwreck of our hopes, I throw all my useless baggage in the sea, that's all, and remain with my will, prepared to live entirely alone and consequently entirely free. You wretched creature, Danglars muttered, the blood draining from his face, for he knew from long experience the solidity of the obstacle he had suddenly run up against. Wretched? Eugenie repeated. Did you say wretched, monsieur? <laughs> Not at all, I assure you, and the exclamation seems altogether too theatrical and pretentious. On the contrary, I am anything but wretched. I ask you, what more could I want than I have? People consider me beautiful, which is enough to be favourably received. I like to be received with a smile which is becoming to a face and which makes those around me appear less ugly than usual. I have some wit, and a certain relative sensitivity that allows me to extract what I find acceptable from the generality of existence and bring it into my own, like a monkey cracking a green nut to take out what is inside. I am rich because you have one of the finest fortunes in France. I am your only child, and you are not obstinate like the fathers in plays at the Porte Saint-Martin or the Gaete, who disinherit their daughters because they refuse to give them grandchildren. In any case, the law in its wisdom has deprived you of the right to disinherit me, at least entirely, just as it has deprived you of the power to force me to marry some monsieur or other. So, beautiful, witty and blessed with some talent, as they say in the comic operas, and rich. Why, that's happiness, monsieur. So how can you call me wretched? Danglars, seeing his daughter smiling and proud to the point of insolence, could not suppress a surge of aggression which expressed itself as a sharp cry, but that was all. Before his daughter's quizzical look, confronted by this fine black eyebrow raised interrogatively, he turned around cautiously and immediately got his anger under control, repressing it with the iron hand of circumspection. Indeed, my girl, he replied, smiling, you are everything that you boast of being. Except one thing. I don't want to tell you too directly what that is. I should prefer to let you guess. Eugenie looked at Danglars, very surprised that he could challenge one of the jewels in the crown that she had so arrogantly just placed on her head. <laughs> My daughter, the banker went on, you have explained to me quite clearly the feelings which guide the resolve of a girl such as yourself when she has decided not to get married. Now it is my turn to tell you what are the motives of a father such as myself when he has decided that his daughter will get married. Eugenie bent her head, not like an obedient daughter listening to her father, but like an adversary in waiting, ready to answer back. My dear, said Danglars, when a father asks his daughter to take a husband, he always has some reason for wishing to see her married. 
Some fathers suffer from the folly you just mentioned, that of wanting to live again through their grandchildren. I'll tell you straight away, I do not have that weakness, and I am more or less indifferent to the joys of family life. This I can confess to a daughter whom I know to be detached enough herself to understand my feeling and not to reproach me with it. Good, said Eugenie. Very good. Let's be frank. I like that. Oh, as you see, without as a general rule sharing your partiality for frankness, I do resort to it when I think the circumstances require it. So, let me continue. I offered you a husband. Not for your sake, because I honestly was not thinking about you at all at the time. You like frankness. I hope that is frank enough for you. The reason was that I needed you to marry that husband as soon as possible, for the sake of some commercial transactions that I am currently engaged in. Eugenie started. That's how it is, my girl. And you must not mind, because you are obliging me to speak in this way. You understand. I regret having to go into these questions of arithmetic with an artist such as yourself, who is afraid to go into a banker's study in case she encounters some unpleasant and anti-poetic feelings. However, you should know that there are lots of things to be learnt, even to the advantage of young women who do not wish to get married inside that banker's study, where, incidentally, you were willing enough to risk setting foot yesterday to ask me for the thousand francs which I give you every month to amuse yourself. For example, is it, it, it is out of consideration for your nervous susceptibilities that I say this here in the drawing room, one may learn that a banker's credit is his whole life, physical and moral. Credit sustains the man as breath sustains a body. And Monsieur de Monte Cristo made a pretty little speech to me on the subject one day, and I have never forgotten it. One may learn that, when credit is withdrawn, the body becomes a corpse, and that this can happen very quickly to a banker who has the honour to be the father of a girl with such an excellent command of logic. Eugenie, instead of bowing under the blow, rose to meet it. Ruined, she said. You have hit on the very word, my dear girl, the right word, said Danglars, rummaging around his chest with his hands, while his coarse features kept the smile of a man who might be deficient in heart, but not in wit. Ruined, precisely. Ah, said Eugenie. Yes, Ruined. Well, now the dreadful secret's out, as the tragic poets say. So, listen here, my dear girl. While I tell you how the disaster can be reduced... So listen here, my dear girl, while I tell you how the disaster can be reduced. Not for me, but for you. Oh, you know very little about the human face, monsieur, Eugenie exclaimed, if you imagine that I deplore the catastrophe you are describing for my own sake. What does it matter if I am ruined? Haven't I still got my talent? Why should I, like Pasta, Malibran or Grisi, not make for myself what you could never have given me, however great your fortune, an income of one hundred or one hundred and fifty thousand livres that I owe to myself alone, and which, instead of reaching me like those miserable twelve thousand francs that you used to give me, with sour looks and reproachful reflections on my prodigality, will come with clapping cheers and flowers and even if i do not have this talent your smile suggests you doubt that i do shall i not still have that passionate love of independence which will always be more important to me than any treasure and which with me even takes precedence over the instinct of self-preservation no i am not sorry for myself because i shall always manage to get by I shall still have my books, my pencils, and my piano, things which are not expensive and which I shall always be able to obtain. And if you think I am sorry for Madame Danglars, then there too you can think again. Either I am very mistaken, or my mother has taken every necessary precaution to ensure that the catastrophe threatening you will pass her by. I hope she has managed to protect herself. She was certainly not distracted in her fortune hunting by her concern for me because, thank heaven, she left me all my independence on the excuse that I liked my freedom. Oh no, monsieur, 
Since my childhood I have seen too many things going on around me, and understood them too well, for misfortune to make any more impression on me than it ought. Ever since I can remember, no one has loved me. Too bad, and this has naturally led me to love nobody. So much the better. There you have my credo. In that case, Danglars said, pale with an anger which did not originate in an injured paternal love. Mademoiselle, in that case, do you persist in wishing to bring about my ruin? Your ruin? said Eugenie. I bring about your ruin? What do you mean? I don't follow you. I'm glad to hear it. That leaves me a ray of hope. Listen. I'm listening said Eugenie, staring so hard at her father that he had to make an effort not to lower his eyes beneath the young woman's powerful gaze. Monsieur Cavalcanti is marrying you, Danglars went on, and in doing so he will bring a dowry of three million which he will invest with me. Splendid, said Eugenie with utter contempt, smoothing her gloves against one another. Do you think I would hold those three million against you? said Danglars. Not at all. Those three million are intended to produce at least ten more. With another banker, a colleague of mine, I have obtained a concession on a railway, the only industry which nowadays offers those fabulous chances of immediate success that law managed to convince the good people of Paris, who are always enchanted by speculation, were to be found in some imaginary Mississippi. By my estimate, a millionth of a rail should yield the same as formerly an acre of fallow land on the banks of the Ohio. It's a mortgage investment, which is progressive, as you see, since one will obtain at least ten, fifteen, twenty, or a hundred pounds of iron in exchange for one's money. Well, a week from now, I have to put four millions in my name. As I have said, these four millions will produce ten or twelve. But when I visited you the day before yesterday, monsieur, as you must remember, Eugenie went on, I saw you cashing in, that is the term, I believe, five and a half million. You even showed it to me in two treasury bonds, and you were surprised that a piece of paper which was so valuable didn't dazzle me like a flash of lightning. Yes, but those five and a half million are not mine. They are simply a proof of the confidence that people have in me. My title as a people's banker has gained me the confidence of the hospitals, and those five and a half million belong to them. Any other time, I should not hesitate to make use of them, but today people know the great losses I have made, and, as I told you, credit is starting to pull away from me. At any moment the authorities could reclaim the deposit, and if I have spent it on something else, I shall be forced into shameful bankruptcy. Believe me, I have no objection to bankruptcy, as long as it makes a man richer and doesn't ruin him. Either you marry Monsieur Cavalcanti and I get the three million from the dowry, or else people will think that I am to get them, or else people will think that I am to get them. Then my credit will strengthen and my fortune, which for the past month or two has been slipping into a bottomless pit in front of me, because of, an, of some incredible ill luck, will be re-established. Do you follow me? Yes, you are pawning me for three million, am I right? The larger the sum, the more flattering it is. It gives you some idea of your value. Thank you. One final word, monsieur. Do you promise me to use the amount of this dowry that Monsieur Cavalcanti is to bring, for as long as you wish, but not to touch the capital? This is not a matter of selfishness, but of scruple. I am quite willing to serve as the instrument for rebuilding your fortune, but I don't wish to be your accomplice in the ruin of others. But I am telling you that with, with these three million... <laughs> do you think you can get by, Monsieur, without having to touch the three million? I hope so, providing that the marriage strengthens my credit. Could you pay Monsieur Cavalcanti the five hundred thousand francs that you are giving me for my contract? He will get them when he comes back from the town hall. Good. Why good? What do you mean? I mean that, while asking me for my signature, you will leave me entirely free in myself. 
Absolutely. Then, good. As I told you, monsieur, I am ready to marry monsieur Cavalcanti. But what do you have in mind? That's my secret. Where would I get my superiority over you if, knowing your secret, I, would entr I were to entrust you with mine? Danglars bit his lip. So, he said, you are prepared to carry out the few official visits that are absolutely necessary? Yes, Eugenie replied. And to sign the contract in three days? Yes. Then I must say good in my turn. And he took his daughter's hand and pressed it between his own. However, what was extraordinary was that while their hands were joined, the father did not dare to say, Thank you, my child, and the daughter had no smile for her father. Is the meeting over? Eugenie's, Eugenie asked. Danglars nodded to show that he had nothing more to say. Five minutes later, the piano was sounding under the fingers of Mademoiselle d'Armilly, and Mademoiselle Danglars was singing Brabantino's Curse from Desdemona. At the end of the piece, Etienne came in and told Eugenie that the, harness, the, harness, the horses were harnessed and the Baroness was waiting for them to go visiting. We have already seen how the two women went to the V-Force, then left to continue their rounds. Chapter 96 The Marriage Contract Three days after the episode that we have just described, that is to say around five o'clock in the afternoon on the day appointed for signing the contract of marriage between Mademoiselle Eugenie Danglars and Andrea Cavalcanti, whom the banker insisted on entitling Prince, a fresh breeze rustled all the leaves in the little garden in front of the Count of Monte Cristo's house. He was getting ready to go out. His horses were waiting for him, pouring the ground with their hoofs, restrained by the coachman who had already been sitting on his box for a quarter of an hour. At this moment, the elegant Phaeton, which we have already had occasion to meet several times, particularly during the evening at Atuel, swung rapidly round the gatehouse and ejected, rather than deposited, on the steps leading up to the house, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti, as gilded and radiant as if he, for his part, were on the point of marrying a princess. He inquired after the Count's health with his usual familiarity, and, bounding lightly up to the first floor, met Monte Cristo himself at the top of the stairs. When he saw the young man, the Count stopped. As for Cavalcanti, he was in full flight, and when he was launched, nothing could stop him. "'Ah, good day, my dear Monte Cristo,' he said. "'Monsieur Andrea,' the other said in his half-mocking tone. How are you? Excellent, as you see. I have come to tell you lots of things. But first, are you coming in or going out? I was going out, monsieur. Well then, so as not to delay you, I'll get into your coach, if I may, and Tom will follow behind with my phaeton in tow. No, the Count said, with an imperceptible smile of contempt, not wanting to be seen in the young man's company. No, I prefer to listen to what you have to say here, my dear Monsieur Andrea. One can speak better in a room where there is no coachman to catch what you say. The Count led the way into a little drawing room on the first floor, sat down, crossed his legs, and motioned to the young man to take a seat. Andrea adopted his most jovial expression. You know, Count, he said, the ceremony takes place this evening, the contract will be signed at the father-in-law's at nine o'clock. Really? Monte Cristo asked. What? Is this news to you? Didn't Monsieur Danglars inform you of this solemn occasion? Yes, he did, the Count said. I had a letter from him yesterday, but I don't think any time was mentioned in it. That's possible. I suppose my father-in-law was relying on word getting around. Well, now... Monte Cristo said. You're happy then, Monsieur Cavalcanti. That's a very desirable match you are entering, and Mademoiselle Danglars is pretty. 
She is, Cavalcanti replied with a good deal of modesty. And most of all, she is very rich, or at least so I understand, said Monte Cristo. Very rich, do you think? the young man repeated. No doubt of it. They say that Monsieur Danglars hides at least hides at least half his wealth. And he admits to fifteen or twenty million, Andrea said, his eyes shining with joy. Besides which, Monte Cristo added, he is on the point of engaging in a form of speculation that is already a bit overdone in the United States and in England, but it was quite new in France. Yes, yes, I know what you mean. It's the railway for which he's just been awarded the contract, I suppose. Precisely. The general view is that he will make at least ten million on the affair. Ten million? Do you really think so? Marvellous, said Cavalcanti, intoxicated by the metallic sound of these golden words. Not to mention, Monte Cristo went on, that this whole fortune will revert to you, which is only right, since Mademoiselle Danglars is an only child. In any case, your own fortune is almost as great as that of your fiancé. At least so your father told me. But let's put aside these money matters. Do you know, Monsieur Andrea, that you have managed this business quite neatly and skilfully? Not bad, said the young man. Not bad at all. I am a born diplomat. Well, you shall be one. You know, diplomacy is not learnt. It's a matter of instinct. So, this is a love match for you? Indeed, I fear it is, Andrea replied, in the tone of voice he had heard Dorante or Valere use, using to answer Alceste in the theatre in the Théâtre Français. And does she love you a little? She must, Andrea said with a victor's smile, since she's marrying me. But let's not forget one very important thing, which is that I was greatly helped in all this. Poof! But certainly. By events? No, by you. By me? Come, come, Prince, Monte Cristo said, ironically stressing the title. What could I do for you? Were not your name, your social standing and your personal qualities enough? No, said Andrea, they weren't. And, Monsieur le Comte, whatever you say, I maintain that the position of a man such as yourself did more than my name, my social standing and my personal qualities. You are utterly mistaken, Monsieur, Monte Cristo said, grasping the young man's treacherous skill and the implication of his words. You gained my protection only after I had inquired into the influence and wealth of your respected father. For who allowed me the honour of knowing you, when I had never seen you in my life, either you or your illustrious sire? It was two close friends of mine, Lord Wilmore and Abbe Boussoni. What encouraged me not to serve as a guarantor for you, but to support you? Your father's name, which is so well known and honoured in Italy. Personally, I don't know you. The Count's calm and easy manner gave Andrea to understand that, for the time being, he was in the grasp of a stronger hand than his own, and that its grip would not be easily broken. "'Tell me,' he said, "'does my father really have a huge fortune, Count?' "'It appears so, Monsieur,' Monte Cristo answered. "'Do you know if the dowry he promised me has arrived?' "'I have received the advice note.' And the three million? In all probability, the three million are on their way. So I shall really have them. <laughs> Damn it, the Count said. It doesn't seem to me, Monsieur, that you have lacked for money so far. Andrea was so surprised that he could not prevent himself from pausing to think for a moment. Then, coming out of his reverie, he said, Monsieur, I have just one request left to make of you, and this one you will understand however disagreeable it may be. Tell me, said Monte Cristo. Thanks to my wealth, I have been brought into contact with many distinguished people, and for the time being at least, I have a host of friends. But in marrying as I shall do before all of Parisian society, I should be sponsored by someone with a famous name, 
and failing my father's hand, it should be that of some powerful man who will lead me to the altar. My father never comes to Paris, does he? He is old, covered in wounds, and, he says, suffers mortal agony agonies every time he travels. I understand. Well, I have a request, request to make of you. Of me? Yes, you. Good Lord, what is it? That you should take his place. What? My dear fellow, after the various contacts, contract, contacts that you have had with me, do you know me so little that you could make such a request? Ask me for the loan of half a million, and though it's an unusually large sum, I swear that the request would be less of a burden to me. You should know, I thought I had already told you, that when the Count of Monte Cristo is involved in any of the things of this world, particularly in spiritual matters, he has never ceased to regard them with the scruples, I might even say the superstitions, of an Oriental. I have a Seraglio in Cairo, another in Smyrna, and another in Constantinople, Constantinople, and you ask me to preside at a wedding? Never. So you are refusing me? Outright. Even if you were my son or my brother, I should refuse in the same way. Well, I never, Andrea said, disappointed. So what is to be done? You have a hundred friends, as you said as you said yourself. Yes, but you were the person who introduced me to Monsieur Danglars. Not at all. Let's get the facts straight. I arranged for you to have dinner with him in Autuel, and you introduced yourself. Why, it's entirely different. Yes, but my marriage, you, you helped. I did? In no way, believe me. Remember what I said to you when you came to ask me to make the proposal? I never matchmake, my dear prince. It's an absolute rule with me. Andrea bit his lips. But you will at least be there? All of Parisian society will be coming. Certainly. Then I shall be there with the rest, the Count said. Will you sign the contract? I see no objection. My scruples don't extend that far. Well then, if you will not agree to anything more, I shall have to make do with what you will give me. But one final word, Count. What's that? I need some advice. Beware. A piece of advice is worse than a helping hand. Oh, you, you can give me this without compromising yourself. Tell me, then. My wife's dowry is 500,000 livres. That's the figure that Monsieur Danglars told me himself. Should I take it or deposit it with the lawyers? Here's how things are usually done. When the parties want to show some gallantry, at the time of the contract, your two notaries agree to meet the following day, or the one after. On the appointed day, they exchange the two dowries, each giving the other a receipt. Then, once the marriage has been celebrated, they put the millions at your disposal, as the one in charge of the joint estate. The, the reason I ask, Andrea said, with ill-disguised unease, is that I thought I understand my father-in-law to say that he intended to invest our funds in the famous railway that you were speaking about a little while ago. So? said Monte Cristo. Everyone agrees that it should allow you to triple your capital in a year. Baron Danglars is a good father and knows how to add up. Very well then, said Andrea. Everything's fine except your refusal, which wounds me deeply. Just put it down to what are, in the circumstances, quite natural scruples. As you wish then, said Andrea. This evening at nine? until this evening. And, though the Count shrank back slightly and his lips paled, while still preserving his polite smile, Andrea seized his hand, pressed it, leapt into his phaeton and rode off. He spent the last four or five hours until nine o'clock in shopping and in visits to drum up interest among the friends whom he had asked to appear at the bankers in their finest carriages, dazzling them with the promise of shares, which were later to turn every head, but in which, for the time being, Danglars had the initiative. At half-past eight, accordingly, Danglars 
at Danglars' main reception room, the gallery leading to it, and the other three reception rooms on the same floor were full of a crowd of scented people, very few of whom were attracted by sympathy, and very many by an irresistible urge to be where they knew something was going on. A self-conscious stylist would say that society receptions are a bed of flowers that attracts capricious butterflies, hungry bees and buzzing hornets. Needless to say, the rooms were resplendent with candles and light poured from the gilt mouldings onto the silk hangings, and all the bad taste of furnishings which expressed nothing but wealth shone out in its full glory. Mademoiselle Eugenie was dressed with the most elegant simplicity, a white silk dress embroidered in white, and a white rose half hidden in her jet black hair made up her entire costume, enriched by not a single jewel. Yet her eyes shone with perfect self-assurance, contradicting what she saw as the vulgarly virginal significance of this outfit. Thirty yards away, Madame Danglars was talking to Debray, Beauchamp and Chateau Renard. Debray had made his entry into the house for this solemn occasion, but like everyone else, and with no special privileges. Monsieur Danglars, surrounded by members of Parliament and men of money, was explaining a new theory of taxation which he intended to introduce when the circumstances compelled the government to call him to ministerial office. Andrea, arm in arm with one of the most dashing young dandies from the opera, was explaining his future plans to him, somewhat impertinently, given that he needed to be bold to appear at ease, and how he intended to advance the cause of Parisian fashions with his income of 75,000 livres. The main crowd was ebbing and flowing around the rooms, like a tide of turquoises, rubies, emeralds, opals and diamonds. As always, it was the oldest women who were the most heavily adorned, and the ugliest who were most determined to make an exhibition of themselves. If there was any fine white lily, or any sweet-scented velvety rose, she had to be hunted down and revealed, hidden in a corner behind a mother, in a turban, or an aunt with a bird of paradise. At intervals, above this crush, this hum, this laughter, the voices of, of the ushers could be heard announcing the name of someone well known in the financial world, respected in the army, or illustrious in the world of letters, and at that a faint movement in the clusters of people would greet the name. But for each one who had the privilege of causing a stir in this ocean of human waves, how many were greeted with indifference or a snigger of contempt? Just as the hand of the massive clock, of the clock showing the sleeping Endymion, reached nine on the gold face, and the bell, faithfully translating the thought of the machine, struck nine times, the Count of Monte Cristo's name rang out in its turn, and everyone in the crowd, as if drawn by an electric flash, turned towards the door. The Count was dressed, with his usual simplicity, in black. A white waistcoat covered his broad and noble chest, and his black collar seemed unusually neat, outlined against the masculine pallor of his complexion. His only ornament was a watch-chain so fine that the slender band of gold was barely, barely visible against the white stitching. A crowd immediately assembled round him. At a glance, the Count observed Madame Danglars at one end of the room, Monsieur Danglars at the other end, and Mademoiselle Eugenie in front of him. He went across, first of all, to the Baroness, who was talking to Madame... Madame de Vifort, who had come alone, Valentine still being unwell. Without deviating from his course, the crowd parting before him, he went from the Baroness to Eugenie, whom he complimented in a few concise and restrained words which impressed the proud artist. Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly was standing close by her. She thanked the Count for the letters of recommendation that he had so kindly given her for Italy, and which, she said, she intended to make use of very shortly. On leaving these ladies, he turned around and found himself close to Danglars, who had come over to offer him his hand. After completing these three social duties, 
Monte Cristo stopped and looked around him with that self-confident look which bears the stamp of an expression peculiar to people who belong to a particular rank in society, and above all, to those who enjoy a certain influence in it. A look that seems to imply, I have fulfilled my obligations, now let others pay their dues to me. Andrea, who was in an adjoining room, felt the sort of shiver that Monte Cristo sent through the crowd, and hastened to pay his respects. He found him entirely surrounded. People were hanging on his every word, as is always the case with those who say little and never waste words. At that moment the notaries entered and set up their scrawled signs on the gold-embroidered velvet covering on the table that had been prepared for the signing, a table of gilded wood. One notary sat down, the other remained standing. They were about to proceed to the reading of this contract which half of Paris would sign having gathered for the occasion. Everyone took their place, or rather the women clustered round while the men, less moved by what Beaulieu calls the energetic style, commented on Andrea's nervous agitation, Monsieur Danglars's concentration, Eugenie's impassivity, and the lively and casual way in which the Baroness was treating this important business. There was total silence while the contract was read, but, as soon as the reading was over, the noise resumed in every room, twice as loud as before. The jealous gathering had been deeply impressed by these marvellous amounts, these millions paving the future path of the young couple, complemented by the exhibition of the bride-to-be's trousseau and diamonds in a room entirely set aside for them. All this doubled Mademoiselle Danglars's charms, blotting out the light of the sun in the eyes of the young men. As for the women, it goes without saying that, jealous though they were of the millions, they did not believe them necessary to appear beautiful. Andrea, hemmed in by his friends, complimented, adulated, was beginning to believe in the reality of the dream he was having. Andrea was about to lose his head. The notary som solemnly took the quill, raised it in the air and said, Gentlemen, the contract is about to be signed. The Baron was to sign first, then the proxy for Monsieur Cavalcanti the Elder, then the Baroness, then the future spouses, as they say in that abominable style commonly used on stamped paper. The Baron took the quill and signed, followed by the proxy. The Baroness approached on, Madame's, on Madame de Vifor's arm. My friend, she said, taking the quill. Isn't it just too much? An unexpected incident connected with that business of murder and theft of which the Count of Monte Cristo was so nearly a victim has deprived us of Monsieur de Vifor's company. Oh, good Lord, Danglars exclaimed, with no more emotion than he might have said, What? I really couldn't care less. Oh, dear, Monte Cristo said, coming over. I am very afraid I may be the involuntary cause of his absence. What, Count, you? said Madame Danglars as she signed. If that is so, beware, because I never, I shall never forgive you. Andrea pricked up his ears. It is not at all my fault, said the Count, so I wish it to be put on record. Everyone was listening eagerly. Monte Cristo, who so rarely opened his mouth, was about to speak. You remember, the Count said, in the midst of the most complete silence, that it was in my house that he died, the, that wretch who came to rob me and who was killed as he left the house, as they believe, by his accomplice. Yes, said Danglars. Well, in order to assist him, they undressed him and threw his clothes into a corner where the police came and collected them. But the police, while taking the coat and jacket as evidence, forgot the waistcoat. The colour drained visibly from Andrea's face, and he edged towards the door. He could see a cloud looming on the horizon, and this cloud seemed to be drawing a storm along behind it. So this miserable waistcoat was found today, covered in blood, with a hole above the heart. The ladies cried out, and one or two got ready to faint. It was brought to me. No one could guess where the rag came from, I thought that it probably belonged to the victim. Then, suddenly, my valet, 
gingerly and with some disgust looking over this lugubrious relic, felt a piece of paper in the pocket. He took it out and found a letter. Addressed to whom? Why, Baron, to you? To, to me? Danglar exclaimed. Yes, by heaven, to you. Yes, I managed to read your name under the blood with which the paper was stained. Monte Cristo replied in the midst of a general gasp of surprise. But how has this prevented Monsieur de Villefort from being here? Madame Danglars asked, looking anxiously at her husband. Quite simple, Madame, Monte Cristo replied. The waistcoat and the letter were what are called exhibits in evidence. I sent both of them to the Crown Prosecutor. You understand, my dear Baron, the legal process is the most reliable in criminal cases. There may be some plot against you. Andrea stared hard at Monte Cristo and vanished into the second drawing room. It, it, it could be, said Danglars. Was this murdered man not a former convict? Yes, said the Count, a former convict named Caderousse. Danglars went a little pale. Andrea left the second drawing room to go into the antechamber. But, but sign, sign, said Monte Cristo. I see that my story has upset everyone, and I most humbly beg your pardon, Madame la Baronne, and that of Mademoiselle Danglars. The Baroness, who had just signed, handed the quill to the notary. Prince Cavalcanti, the lawyer said. Prince Cavalcanti, where are you? Andrea? Andrea? repeated several voices of young people who were on, already on such terms of intimacy with the noble Italian that they called him by his first name. "'Call the prince. Tell him it's his turn to sign,' Danglars shouted to an usher. But at the same moment the crowd of onlookers swept back into the main reception room, terrified as if some dreadful monster had entered the apartments, querems quem devoret. Indeed, there was a reason to shrink back and cry out in fear. An officer of the gendarmerie stationed two gendarmes at the door of each drawing room, then marched over towards Danglars, preceded by a commissioner of police decked out in his scarf of office. Madame Danglars gave a cry and fainted. Danglars, who felt himself under threat, some consciousnesses, consciences are never at rest, presented his guests with a face contorted by terror. "'What is the matter, monsieur?' asked Monte Cristo, going to meet the commissioner. "'Which of you gentlemen is named Andrea Cavalcanti?' the commissioner asked, without replying to the Count's question. A cry of amazement rose from every corner of the room. Everyone looked round and asked questions. "'Who is this Andrea Cavalcanti, then?' Danglars inquired, in a state of near distraction. "'A former convict who escaped from the penitentiary of Toulon. "'What, what crime has he committed?' "'He is accused of the murder of one Caderousse,' the commissioner said, in his impassive voice. "'Formerly his fellow inmate, as the said Caderousse was leaving the house of the Count of Monte Cristo.' Monte Cristo looked quickly around him. Andrea had vanished. And I think that is where we shall leave it for tonight. Dun, dun, dun!